Hey everyone, so uh, this video is the first uh, of a series that's going to teach or walk through what I can cover in one semester in a three credit course in uh, learning Python data analytics. And this course or these videos are, are um, at least this part of it, are targeted towards freshmen and sophomores who are just getting started, have never taken a stats class or a programming class, at least at the college level. And they want to just know if they like the area of data science, data science or data analytics, and uh, take their first course to 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 see what this area is all about and decide if they want to continue. So this book or this course actually would also be good if you're a um, high school student who's uh, pretty ambitious and uh, wants to give this a shot, or uh, if you're a, a professional who's already been through college and just wants to retool on uh, learning how to write code in Python to do uh, data analytics, uh, you'll be able to pick this up pretty quick as well. So uh, in this set of video uh, videos, I'm gonna use Python as the primary technology with a lot of different packages. Uh, why Python? Well, um, the whole area, the whole size of the pie when it comes to, to careers in data analytics is growing. R used to be the dominant language. It's uh, actually still growing. Uh, it hasn't gone down, um, but Python has grown faster and has overtaken R sometime uh, a few years back, at least in terms of being the most prominent language for analytics. There's advantages and disadvantages of both. I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I'm not biased towards either. They're actually both great for different things. But to be honest, Python has really taken over in popularity and the support and available online. Um, although R is still better for uh, visualizations and certain algorithms. Um, really, the, the future is clear in the, at least the next few years that it's it's really Python right now if you want to get started in data analytics. That's not going to last. There's already other languages that are much, much faster and more efficient like Julia that are up and coming um, that will overtake Python. This is just for now, this is the language we're going to use. And here's just a whole bunch of surveys and evidence and that type of thing. Anyway, let's talk about IDEs. What are you going to use in this video series? Well, I'm going to use a cloud based tool, Google Collab. Uh, partly because uh, Collab is new enough, I think they're trying to attract people to use it, and so they're giving an insane amount of processing power. Um, I've used Jupyter Notebooks in the past. Oh, by the way, we're going to use the IPy Notebook file format uh, throughout this uh, video series. Um, so not the .py file format. IPy Notebooks was uh, started by Jupyter Notebook. They were the, the OGs, so to speak, with that, but several other options have come out. There's lots of them. These are four of, of dozens. I'm just showing these because they're common tools that our students are already using in other classes, like Visual Studio Code. Uh, these are two examples of programs you would install on your own machine um, if you want to do that. Uh, I am going to use a cloud IDE, and here's a couple of cloud IDEs, both Collab and Azure uh, Notebooks. So you have nothing to install, uh, which is a nice advantage. There are some disadvantages. You have to mount Google Drive if you want to read and write to local files with Google Cloud. It's not that hard. It's it's just kind of a 30 second annoyance at the start of every project, really. But there's even ways around that. We can access files from the web instead of our local Google uh, Drive. That makes things a little faster. But perhaps the most important factor is speed. Um, I went through and timed processing a large data file in each one of these. And the plugin I used for Visual Studio Code for IPy Notebooks was by far the slowest. Actually, no, I take that back. Azure Notebooks was the slowest. Um, Visual Studio Code was faster, but it was a factor of like 10 times slower than Jupyter Notebooks on the same laptop. On my laptop, I've got 64 gigs of RAM and a Core i9 processor, basically the nicest one I could get on a Dell XPS 15-inch uh, laptop. and. Uh, even with that really powerful laptop, Google Collab was by far the fastest, which tells me they're probably really giving you quite a bit of power, including a GPU in their um, in their uh, online tool. I wonder if maybe that'll go down in the future once they get a large enough user base or something like that. I have no idea. But uh, So I'll be using in this video Google Collab, but you're welcome to use any of these. It should work all the same just fine. Okay, so... Uh, couple of quick hit items. Let's start with uh, running the examples in this book. I, If you're not using this book and you're just watching the YouTube video, you can ignore this part. But if you have the book, you'll notice I'll refer to it often in the videos anyway. So it's uh, um, just so you know what you're going to be looking at. I'll often have, co have code samples like this. And there'll be a link right here. This is the Google Collab icon. 
and it'll take you to my own IPI notebook file in collab.research.google.com, which I've got shared for viewing purposes. If you want to open this up, you can try out uh, the, the, the code in this book. You can come here and, and run the code. You won't be able to edit it, but you could easily decide, all right, I want to take this into my own collab or my own Google Drive. Just come here to file and save a copy in Drive. And then you'll have a copy of my file from the book in your own drive. And if you're watching this on on, uh, on YouTube and you're not part of my class, here's the code. You can copy it. It'll take you a few seconds longer just to type it in by hand, but it should be uh, pretty straightforward. So that's how this book will work in this class. Um, uh, for now, I'm not going to go into any more depth on Python at all, other than to just introduce you to the environment. But I do want to get you started in Collab. So let's say uh, I'm going to leave this page. Let's start. Just open a brand new um, uh, browser window here, and I'm going to go to Collab. Dot research. Oh, I guess you can't see this. Let me, let me move up my recorder here. I'll move this down. All right. Collab. Dot research. Dot Google. Whoops. Dot Google. Dot com. And that'll take you to this screen right here. So if you want to follow along, uh, all I have to do is have a Google account. Come here and I'm going to start with a new Python 3 notebook. Let this load. All right, and here's what it looks like. Let's start by giving this a name. I'm going to call this Python 0 because it's really before chapter 1. Uh, com I'll call this environment. Comments. Okay, so if you're brand new to all this, never been a programmer before, never done stats other than high school, uh, or using these tools, here's I'll share what you're looking at. IPy notebook files uh, let you add blocks. It's easier for running a portion of code. Um, with a .py file, I have one document. Think of like a Word or a text document where you can write as many lines of code as you want. But if you only want to run a couple of lines, you have to select just a few lines at a time to run those. An IPy notebook file is just meant to make that slightly easier by giving you a chunk or a block of code, which I can add these blocks right here, places where I can write code and it'll print out some output. I can also have text blocks here, and I can move, by the way, all these blocks up and down with my little up and down arrows here. Um, different editors, if you're in Jupyter Notebook or something else, they all have methods to do the same things. It might not be an arrow right here, but you might be able to click and drag and the whole block up and down or something like that. So here the text block, um, there, there's, it's got its own format. I'm going to put here comments. Uh, its own format for formatting text. I highlight it and I can use the bold text size here. This will make it bigger or smaller. Uh, none of these will make it the regular size. Notice as soon as I click off the block, it shows the text. Uh, bold adds the stars around it. If I want to increase the size, I put one hashtag. A second one makes it a little smaller and then a third one a little smaller. So that's what you're working with. That's about all I use just to keep things organized. So uh, let's start with simple comments in the code. So start with a pound sign or hashtag and put your name, uh, I don't know, whatever you like. Uh, my first .ipy notebook file in Google Collab. Oh, you see this? This is just something Google Collab does. Here in my settings under tools, I was playing around with this in class earlier. Editor, no, miscellaneous. Power level, I had no clue what this was, so I tried it out. Uh, as soon as I change it to many power, let me show you what it does. As I type, it starts adding fireworks and these combos down here, I guess to keep you from getting bored. <laughs> um, some power means that it, I think what it means is it turns that on after I've been typing several characters in a row without having to delete or something like that. I'm actually going to switch back to no power. Um, no, let's do some. We'll make it fun. Corgi and kitty mode. This is a collab only thing. Somebody was having a good time when they created this. Uh, there we go. As soon as you start typing, here's my corgi. I think when I run it, does that make the kitty come? I can't remember. Something like that. Uh, anyway, at some point a cat will walk across the screen. I'm not going to use those. <laughs> Let's take those off. Uh, miscellaneous. A few other options since I'm here in settings that you might find useful. Show line numbers. When you get errors, sometimes you might find it useful to check that box. 
Uh, here, I, you can see I've got one, two, three, it's just numbering the lines that I'm working on, because sometimes when you get an error, it'll tell you, not sometimes, all the time, it'll tell you the line number that you're working on. I actually find it a little bit annoying, um, I, and I think that's why they didn't turn it on by default. I think our code blocks are usually short enough that's not hard to find the line that we're talking about. And uh, that's not true with other types of programming. If you're doing app development or web development, you can get thousands and thousands and thousands of lines. But not really with an IPy notebook, so I don't really like line numbers, but uh, you can explore these other defaults here on your own. So here's an example of a block. Uh, you saw me a moment ago, I played this block. A couple ways to do that. Now when you play it or run a block, you're executing the code. What does that mean? Well, let me go back to the book actually for a second and talk about the difference between um, an interpreted versus a compiled language. So Python is interpreted, which means um, that when you run the code, it interprets your code in real time, so to speak, and uh, turns it into executable instructions versus a compiled language, um, C++, C Sharp, uh, where the code has to be compiled first before it's run and executed. Now, to, basically, that just means that when it's compiled, it's turned into a set of instructions that's um, executed faster than if it were to be interpreted. So there's a little bit more upfront time to compile it first, but then it runs faster in execution or runtime. There's advantages and disadvantages of both. Interpreted languages like Python are usually more weakly typed, meaning we're not going to have to be as strict about defining uh, uh, data types. Um, you'll see what I mean by that in the next video if you're new to programming. Um, the, the downside is that it does take slower to run the code because we haven't been as organized and uh, specific up front when we wrote the code. So uh, really for Python and for what we're doing, an interpreted language is appropriate. Uh, we're not going to be creating, when, when we're going through a data analytics project and exploring uh, data, we're gonna be writing custom code often uh, to some degree. And so it makes sense to have an interpreted language um, and we're not processing so much data during this exploration process that the speed is super critical yet. It will be though later on. Anyway, uh, that's all that means. Let's go back here. Whoops, uh, I meant to go back here. There we go. So to run or execute the code in a block, um, I'm going to either hit this run button or control or shift enter, both will work. What that does, notice it moves my cursor to the next block. And you see this little play thing run here when I hit shift enter or control enter, or if I just hit play and it moves, my, in this case, I actually didn't move my cursor at all. So I think I like shift enter better. So it looks like it did nothing. And that's true because what I've typed here are what we call comments. Comments are things we use in code uh, to document what it is that we're doing and explain it so that when we look at it later, or when others look at our code, they understand what was going through our mind and what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, comments are super useful, but it's often the last thing we worry about when writing code. We worry first about writing effective code, then we worry about comments later. It's just kind of a natural human thing for all programmers, uh, but usually more comments. Uh, some commenting or documenting is another term for it, is at least some documenting is very important. So let me just write one simple command just so you can see how it's going to work. Print, and we'll do our classic uh, hello world that everyone does when they're first teaching learning programming. All right, so print is a function in Python. Think of like an Excel function. Uh, when you go into Excel, uh, if you're familiar with that, which a lot of people are, so this might make it easier to understand. Uh, think about creating a sum function in a, in a blank workbook here to add up two values, two and two. And right here, I'm gonna put equals, and I use the sum function, and then I pass in as arguments or parameters into that function, these two cells, close parenthesis. Sum is the name of the function. These are the parameters that I'm passing in, separated by commas. And then when I hit enter, it's like it's executing that function and returning this value right here. That's essentially exactly what's going on right here, except I don't use the equal sign in front of print and I'm not returning it to a cell, I'm returning it here to, uh, to the screen. So print is a function and I have parameters and since I'm passing in text into that function instead of numbers, I put quotes, either double or single quotes are fine. So let's hit shift enter to run it. And here's my output. So an IPy notebook file, I've got a code block up here with a play button. And then I've got output as a result of that code right below it here. 
and this will clear the output if I ever want to do that. Sometimes our output gets really long and it helps to clear it. So then I can write different code down here and I can kind of write it in chunks. So this is the format of an IPy notebook file. Uh, let's call it good for this video and we'll move on to uh, basic data, uh, basic variables in the next video.